All right, let's move forward. So next we're going to get into, uh, we created a section called gear and scheduling. We wanted to definitely touch upon gear. We didn't want to overemphasize gear. We don't want, I mean, the, the purpose of this class and what we we're trying to do, originally, what, uh, the original idea of the class was going to be a breakdown of our day and talk about the different things that we do at different parts of the day. But I feel like those classes have been overdone. And I know we have a unique perspective, and I know that there's always something to be gained from those, that type of information. But we wanted to focus, I mean, the general focus of everything that we're doing is more of kind of maybe along the abstract, uh, along the stuff, uh, you know, like the business side, the abstract, not necessarily the specifics, because I feel like this is the best way to equip you in order to have a successful business in everything you do. Um, so for gear and scheduling, it's on. Um, don't necessarily focus on the specifics of gear that we use, focus on why we use it, and find gear that meets your needs or gear that solves a particular problem you have. Um, did you have, did you bring Panasonic swag? No. <laughs> I thought Jordan, I thought Jordan was going to send you some t-shirts or something. I don't want to get into discussion of which camera's better. It's, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> find a camera that works for you and go with it. Um, so that's why I just wanted this to be more general. But maybe specifics with other things, but I don't want this, I'm not advocating or pushing for specific things. Here's what we use, uh, two 5D Mark IV cameras, two 1DX Mark IIs. This is all of our lenses, there's a lot of them. We shoot a lot of Canon primes. Uh, 14, 16, 35, 24, 35, 50, 85, 100, 135, 7200. It's like everything. It's a lot. <laughs> um, how many do we normally use in a wedding? We could probably pick two each and probably film most of the day in those two cameras, or those two lenses. Yeah, two 50 millimeters and two 70. Just because there's two yeah. of us? 7200 are important for like, the especially doing large toes. church Catholic weddings where we're in the <laughs> back and we need, to, we need that push. Um, and the 50 millimeter is really our bread and butter lens. And we shoot on a 1.3 crop, so technically that's closer to like an 85. So. That, I mean, we, we were shooting on 60Ds and 5D Mark III's prior, which didn't have a crop. So we had an adjustment period where we had to adjust a different focal length. Well, we have a crop because <coughs> we shoot in 4K, right? It's not because well, no, it's, it's just not? because the, that's how the cameras are designed. Oh, okay, uh, I heard the 1DX Mark III was going to have this zero crop, which was interesting. So both the 5D and the 1DX have the crop in? 1.7. Yeah, different. 1.7, 1.3. I think all the cameras have a crop. The Panasonic's do, the Sony's do. They're all different. And it just it makes it more complicated when you're switching systems because you don't know what lenses you want because they're all going to be a little different. That's why you try before you buy. You've got to aperture rent. <laughs> <clears throat> Audio. We use uh, three Tascam DR10s, three DR40s, uh, Zoom F4, Sennheiser D1835, Sennheiser Mickey 2 Lavs, which we have on us right now, and uh, our older ME2 Lavs is back up. Whirlwind XLR splitter, Shure attenuator, and miscellaneous cables, basic audio. We typically only use two Tascam DR10s and maybe one DR40, but I have three because honestly, the, the Zoom F4 replaced one of my DR40s. I think I only bring two these days. And, um, I mean, the, the DR10s are great for kind of like putting on the efficient, the groom, or the bride. Uh, the Tascam DR40s <clears throat> I use as backup to my Zoom F4, which I have in the back over there recording the audio today. Um, we can get into a discussion about more about later, but there is a difference with better sound equipment. Uh, better sound equipment has a lower noise floor, better preamps, and what that means is that you can do more to it in post than you would um, otherwise. We started, we, we've always been using kind of cheaper audio equipment and didn't realize that there was better. And the better you get, just the better your audio is going to come out. And it's almost like having raw a little bit, like raw audio, where you could do a lot more. The, the more raw the audio or video is, the more manipulation you can do in post. Uh, Sennheiser D1835 is, is a wireless handheld system I use for rehearsal dinners, and I also bring it in for toasts. Uh, the LAVs, these LAVs are way better than um, just the generic ME2s that come uh, with Sennheiser. Uh, we re really like the, the full-bodied sound that we get out of these microphones. 
XLR splitter, great multi-purpose tool, just to kind of like be able to get split an XLR source. Any attenuators, uh, just in case you have a hot source and you need to just bring it down about 20 decibels. This is probably, I mean, do you guys have questions about audio stuff without getting like too crazy about like? Just a quick one. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, to reception, uh, do you ever get any pushback from DJs when you are trying to tell them? To All the time. I mean, DJs and bands, it's complicated, it's tough, it's a dance. I do it every single time. It, it's, that's why even with like the, what I was talking about the last segment about like the networking, you know, it's just, it's this mentality of going to the DJ and saying, introducing yourself, I'm a videographer, hey, do you have a card? You know, when we, whenever we do films, we like to promote and tag the vendors who are working with us. And then as soon as they give you a card, they, they open up because, hey, like, hey, I love being tagged. This is great. Then when, you, then when you start asking for things like a line or, you know, here's my microphone, they're a lot more receptive to doing it. <clears throat> And I think also when you just explain to them, because a lot of them might not understand why we need our own microphone, it's just to create a consistent sound. We need to make sure that our, our film, because our audio is so important, and it's like a huge part of our films. So we want to be in control of our own audio. And when you kind of tell them that, they kind of understand. Otherwise, every film is going to sound different, <clears throat> depending on who you're working with. And even if they have good <laughs> microphones, even if they have like Shure Betas, or if you like Sennheiser, and you have the same Sennheiser you have, if you don't split that, um, the DJ or band is going to be uh, processing that, 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 uh, that audio, so it's going to sound a lot different. That's why you want to get that feed directly off the receiver. So like if you, uh, for example, <coughs> like also do give them your mic, do you just let it split the output and give the DJ one output, yep. or do you uh, let the DJ take the output and you take it through the line? I, sp I, sp I give them the receiver, then I, uh, on, off the receiver, I, when the DJ, when I'm handing it off to DJ or band, I hand the receiver, the receiver has a like a one foot XLR coming into the uh, whirlwind splitter, and then you know I then if they don't have an XLR cable, I'll give them an XLR cable to patch into their system. Then I'm taking another um, from the splitter. Then I can go to my my recorder. So your output is before it gets to their mixer. Right, and that's we, what we I, don't that's want. What I'm on. We don't want their reverb and stuff in the recording. Or even because they do a lot of uh, audio manipulation just to make it sound good for live. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like uh, so many times in the past they'll have good microphones and it'll sound good live in person, but it, it's not good for recording. It just sounds weird and different. So I, I like that. I, I just like it straight off the microphone. Ryan, how much time does it take to set this up? Because I'm just thinking in, in all the ways that uh, I've shot where we don't have a terrible amount of time to, uh, in between the, the reception and the uh, portrait shots and all that. How much time does it take? Uh, it used to take more. I mean, I can get it done in a couple minutes if they're, if they're receptive and easygoing. Some bands or DJs want to run a lot of checking on the mic, but if I absolutely can't do it, I'll look at what they have. I'll try to split off what they have. If worst case scenario, if, if everything just like goes to crap, you know, I'll just put a lavalier on the toaster. It's kind of my backup. Always, always have a lav at the go, ready to um, get the, the toaster. And we'll go into that a little bit more later just because audio is so important to us. So we go to great lengths to make sure we get good audio. It also helps that we're two people. So I'm getting like detail shots at the reception <coughs> hall. Um, and he'll set up lights and do audio. So we're able to kind of like work together. I'm so also it's the hard, mule. It's hard, it's hard if you're one person. Or Carry all the stuff. <coughs> I mean, this is just, no, I, I try not to do it during portraits because I want to be there for portraits. Yeah, we're both there for that. This is just uh, between, it, during, during cocktail. cocktail. Sometimes I can get it earlier. You know, sometimes I'll try to get into the reception. This is, I'm going to get to this in a little bit, but sometimes I try to get into the reception earlier to set up lights or to, to do whatever audio I can do at the time. But I don't touch their gear unless they're there. I've learned that lesson. Can you walk me through how you apply the lava mic to whoever's giving? I haven't done that yet. I'm usually just relying completely on the feed from the DJ. Like how to put a lav? Well, it's, I guess like how you have that conversation, especially if, you know, as a guy you're trying to put a lav on a lady who's, you know, you just don't know where you, you can actually apply that. <laughs> it's, it's probably a different discussion. I mean, we could definitely do something maybe after the class. Um, but one thing I will say is you, you tell them, don't, don't ask. Don't ask for permission. Just say, hey, I need to mic you up for the bride and groom. And it's usually the maid of honor and the best man, and they're like, oh, they hired you. I guess I need to do it. 
So. Obviously, a lot of placement <laughs> is difficult, especially when you're dealing with dresses. It's easy for guys. Inside pocket, love right here. Mm -hmm. Dresses, you have to be more uh, creative. I mean, it's whole usually. If I mean, I can just talk about the dresses real quick. I know you said, but I mean, usually, no matter. There's something here you can clip to, and then on the back, like especially like what I have here, the dresses are like that. You can literally just clip it here. And it's not pretty, but you're filming the front. Yeah. That makes sense. So you love the cord, like over the shoulder. Yeah, I would just start like tucking it into their armpit and underneath. I'm a girl though, so I'm like into their dress and stuff. It's a lot um, harder for guys to do it because it's like you know yeah. you don't want to. <laughs> yes, that's a great idea. Getting a bridesmaid to help, or yeah, another female. So I know you, you kind of said that this was a setup for a reception. Is this the same setup for a ceremony audio setup? Well, this is just my audio gear in general. Uh, for ceremony, uh, what I'll do is I'll put a lot on the officiant and the groom, and. Um, if they have an alternate source, I'll usually get it, but I can probably count on one hand in the last five years we've, we've ever used it. I mean, it's just essentially, it's there as a backup. If, if there's a backup available, I'll get it. But you, even if it is, most, most church systems are pretty terrible um, if you can interface with them. But they're, they're just, they just generally sound bad. Their, their microphones sound bad. It's just I'd rather just put a second lav on the efficient just to make sure I get what I need. <clears throat> but for audio setup, yeah, I, I, mean, I'm, I will try to get a feed off of what it, wherever it's coming from with my Zoom F4. No, there's, been, there's even newer equipment out. I thought the Zoom F4 was the, the best thing in the world. The F6 is amazing. The uh, sound devices has a Mix 6. It's, very, it's new with like floating point 32-bit. Mm -hmm. It's essentially audio raw. The, the, those, those ones are, are amazing. We need to upgrade next year. <laughs> Or before the end of the year, so we can get the tax rate off. Mm. Ooh, what? <laughs> Rent it first. <laughs> now I already know I want it. Um, Mavic 2 Pro, smart controller, inspired to the X5S gimbal, Polar Pro filters. Big advocate for filters um, for the for the drone. Big advocate because the thing is, um, up in the sky, you, you need to cut out that light. It's better to. Uh, I throw an ND8 uh, with polarizer on all of my drones. I find generally though that that's going to give the best results. I have that on my Mavic Pro and my Inspire 2. And I even have a landing pad I bring with me sometimes. It's great if you're like in a dusty field and you can't really land anywhere. Um, I fly mostly with my Inspire 2. Mavic Pro 2 is back up or for times when I just can't get a drone where I need to go. It's kind of new, so I haven't used it as much. Lighting, two Dita light, DLH4s, dimmer. I mean, you can see my Dita lights right there. We have two torch LEDs. I have a light mat um, f that I use for interviews, uh, not on wedding days, more for kind of like other, other projects. Sometimes, um, I mean, wedding related, so that's why I put it up here. Like a love story or something. <clears throat> right. <coughs> I mean, again, with lights, light, lights have changed a lot. Um, you know, uh, one of the, some of the bigger advances with lights have come with like battery powered lights. You know, like the practical lights, and I keep hearing talk of other lights that are out there as well. Yeah, you can change with your phone, like the color temperature. Change with your phone. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit more about lights in a second, but I just want, want, kind of wanted to go over the gear we use. We use Adidas lights for big ceremonies. Uh, I'm sorry, some ceremonies when we need the back light or front light. No, front light the aisle. Have you ever done a ceremony and it's like really dark in there? Like if you're inside, yeah. If you're inside and it's, can it's a candlelight ceremony, and it, you know, candlelight meaning you can't see anything on your camera. So we will actually front light the procession and um, then maybe have another light just kind of zoomed. That, that's per, per client. Um, you know, we definitely do that. We talk about that with the planner and such because you, you need to light it, but you also don't want to disrupt the mood. And the uh, photographers usually like the extra light too. So I mean, they're doesn't? on board, yeah. Some of these ceremonies are so dark. <laughs> Any questions about lighting? Um, you know, if, uh, we put these up in ballrooms, and we have our torch LEDs, um, little portable LEDs. We'll just use for fill when we need it. No, it's not. They're older, I think, so they don't have that technology. You have, to, you have to put in actual filters. They're a true tungsten light. I just think tungsten light is the most beautiful. I mean, tungsten light is more beautiful than LED. The LEDs come a long way. 
uh, tungsten, uh, true tungsten light like we have. They're, yeah, they, they, they're AC powered. They're not battery powered because they draw too much current. Um, but they have really great throw and they have really great shaping abilities, which is great if you're working in a really big ballroom and you need to throw light specifically to like just a toaster without flooding it all over the room. The practical lights and some of those newer lights, their LEDs, uh, they've gotten better at their throws and they've gotten better at all the other stuff. Still not quite as good, I don't think, as these, but I mean, I think the technology is kind of catching up. These are, what watts are these? I think 250s. 250? Were there any other questions? I'll come around the room. There's a light up here because mm -hmm. we want to light the bride. We want to yeah, get that magic so we shot. Don't, I mean, it, you know how it is. We can always bump the ISO, but we don't, we're not a fan of bumping ISO. We want to light the subject. It'll look a thousand times better. It'll make them pop. And After that, do you turn the heat? Yep. Yeah. After the processional, I'll, I'll actually go turn the light off, and I'll just kind of leave it up there. Sometimes I'll, if there's drape, I'll kind of pull it behind a drape. Sandbags, we should. We should. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not just that. It's like we have so much gear already. Uh, it's just hard, hard to bring around. So my question was just going to be like, are you going to talk later on about lighting the uh, processional more? Because that's something I, I, have, I think I've heard y'all say before on a video. I don't know where. And I was just really curious about like how we all do that um, in churches. Specifically. Not churches. No. no. Okay. So not churches. <laughs> no. Well, they're... those aren't going to be candlelight. Those aren't going to be dark. Usually. usually they're usually they're not dark. They're usually the not church. really dark. We're talking more of like uh, you know if, he, if there's a ceremony in a room like this. And they turn off all the lights. Where you know they'll put the pipe and drape all around the entire side so it looks nice in here. Then they, they turn off all the lights. And yeah, it's just for stuff like inside here where there's no natural light coming in from outside. Okay. <clears throat> it's rare that you'd be in a church and that you, you don't have enough light inside of a church to kind of at least get your basic stuff. And I, I don't know of a single church like that who's going to be okay with you. <laughs> exactly. We do a lot of outdoors, uh, especially in New Orleans. And so I heard you talk about lighting and wedding. I'm just imagining inside of a Catholic church. Uh, no, sorry. Good, good question. How are they getting that through? <laughs> <laughs> We are not lighting inside a Catholic church. Is it just the two of you, or do you have somebody to carry all this gear for you? That's me. <laughs> when you, you're I all wondering stuff. what exactly I do, I carry stuff. That's just, <laughs> she does everything else, I carry things. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's you know, part of this whole thing, we haven't gone into the whole scheduling thing. Scheduling, uh, we're going to get into some scheduling tips and hacks about better utilizing the time and figuring out how you can do these things more effectively and efficiently without, you know, so that way you're not sacrificing in other areas or running around too hard. Yeah, that, and that's kind of where I was going with that. How in the world are you capturing all these cinematic shots and setting up and toting all this experience? A lot of running. We hustle. You know, we, we, we hustle one day a week to wear pajamas and sleep in. <laughs> well, we don't sleep in anymore. Sleep we have a baby. But... <laughs> <clears throat> it's worth it to go one day hard and have, not saying we're having it off, but you know what I mean. We, we've always, we could use a third person. Like, we could use an assistant. Like, that's actually would be way more manageable. But we're just, right now, try, trying to just do two of us. But, um, yeah, gear management would be easier with another person. Is another question? I have a question. Uh, just thinking about the example, if it was this room, uh, ceremony happened, mm -hmm. let's say they don't want to do they're okay with giving the lights up. Would you still uh, prefer like giving the lights and putting your lights yes. up? Yes. Actual... One of the things, um, I don't know if you noticed this, but we actually turned off the can lights up here because uh, can lights, whether you're talking about a room like this, a ballroom, anywhere, it's going to create a lot of shadow underneath the eyes. Uh, so can lights are always terrible. That's why we brought our own lights to, just to make sure on camera we popped. Mm -hmm. So even if we, we had the choice, we'd still run our own light. It'd still look a lot, a lot better. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right. Supports, three tripods, two monopods with one in the car. Um, Ronin M, Ronin S, uh, two Monfredo light stands. Um, those are our light stands. Two cheetah stands for torch LEDs and a mic stand. 
just basic stuff. I mean, uh, you, this is probably not groundbreaking to anyone, except third, uh, third monopod in a car. I had a monopod break on a wedding day once, and that was, that was pretty bad. So now, now I replaced it with th two new ones, um, threw that one away, used one, our older, the one older one that was still good. Just stays in the car in case we ever need it. Uh, yeah, the light stands, it's really important to get really tall light stands, like if they go up 15 feet, like that's what you're looking for. Because <clears throat> the lower they are, people are going to complain about your lights being too bright or in their eyes, or it's going to cause like harsher <laughs> shadows. So the higher up they can go, the better. So um, I'm not sure what ours are. Ours are I think they're 13s, 13 okay. feet. So maybe 13. 13 feet is a, great, is a great height. I don't think they make 15s. Okay. 12 or 13 is a great height. Yeah, the higher it is, the, the, the and less complaints you get. always put it as high as it goes. Never say, oh, this is enough. Someone's going to complain that it's Just to make bright. sure that center of gravity goes a little bit yeah. higher. What, 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 sorry, never mind. All right, um, rehearsal dinner kit. I have a, a Bose system, Mackie FX8 soundboard, uh, Optima HD projector, uh, two projection screens. I'll get more into re rehearsal dinners later. This is more just a gear list, but I'm a huge proponent of trying to sell rehearsal dinners. And this is the kit that I try to sell for rehearsal dinners. We'll get into that uh, during the next, next portion. What else? I'm like confused about what you're using the projector for. Yeah, you're, you're not, that's not the filming rehearsal dinners. No, it? that's just, it's a kit of stuff I, I have ready to go for rehearsal dinners for when I sell things like love story films, uh, photo slideshows, um, the, the, the PA system is for the toasts. The PA system is essentially just a part of a rehearsal dinner kit now. I try to uh, sell it as an upsell, but it, it's complicated. Again, we'll get into this more later, but with rehearsal dinners, it, it's such a mixed bag where they're great and you'll get a lot of extra income from doing them, but then you try to sell them on a, on a PA system, they say, well, the venue has a PA system. But you, you've done this long enough to know that the PA system in this little dinky restaurant is going to be terrible. Your audio is going to sound bad. So you just have to bring your own anyway just to make sure that the integrity of the film isn't compromised. Um, so I generally bring my PA system to all rehearsal dinners just to make sure I get good, get good audio. And this just happened to us last weekend where the PA system was terrible. And I just had to bring out my own in the rain. It was awful. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, multiple lens, uh, lens pens, $10 at Best Buy. Use them every wedding. Have a little brush, little squeegee thing, um, just to kind of make sure your lenses don't get dirtied or put a thumbprint on them. <coughs> Excuse me. Screwdriver, extra batteries, you know the drill. All right, so I wanted to go into gear tips and hacks to kind of like help you out with um, utilizing the gear better, stuff we've learned that would, it will really increase the quality of your films. Know the difference between line, mic, and phantom levels on your audio equipment. Most, uh, uh, a lot of videographers don't understand the dif difference between line and mic levels, and it's with the equipment that you use in order to kind of capture your level. Like a little DR10 is mic level. And th the main difference is, is that the, uh, the, the audio recorder is looking at how it's uh, receiving the, the signal of audio that's coming in. Ultimately, the best audio you're going to get is going to come in with kind of like line level stuff. Uh, you don't want to, especially when you're in, um, integrating with like a PA system, you don't want to use mic level stuff for that. It's just not going to come in right. Um, and, you know, Phantom, if you're using any sort of condenser microphone, uh, but probably not for weddings. Probably don't need that. So <clears throat> line and mic level is just having the right tool for the right job. Um, is, is really important. You know, it's like I'm not an advocate for kind of just like draping, you know, like a, a lavalier over a sound, bo a sound speaker, something like that. I don't think you get great audio doing that. I'm all about just getting line level equipment stuff that you can plug into a PA system and just get the best levels, the cleanest audio that's going to sound the best in post. Um, did you guys have any questions about that or? I'm still quite not quite sure what the is this like different inputs on the settings on the recorder that you can switch? Between? Yeah, there are different settings on the recorder. So when it's line level, it's going to be um, a more powerful signal. When it's mic level, it's the recorder is looking for a weaker signal. Um, so if you try to put, you know, if you're trying, if, you, if the recorder is mic only, but then the system that you're interfacing it with is giving out a line level signal, 
it's just it's not going to match up right, and it's just not you're not going to get the cleanest audio. I, I think I, I, don't, I don't think my equipment has those, but I use a tenuator. Is that kind of like the same thing whenever you have a more powerful source? It's not. It, it to me, it doesn't sound as good. Now, attenuators are great to have because it, sometimes if you don't have one, you're just not you're just going to get terrible audio. For me, I use attenuators when I'm coming off of uh, like a DJ's um, system, and the DJ is kind of like um, um, giving a, a pushing a li line that's too hot to the speakers, and you're coming out the back of the speaker, and and no matter how how much you turn it down in your recorder, it's just not going low enough. But even with an attenuator, it's you're still going to hear it peaking a little bit, even though it's it within acceptable levels. It, it's definitely a must-have tool to kind of bring the, the levels down. But <coughs> so that's going to be on certain music like uh, the Zoom. So what are, I heard when you said or whatever for the Tascam. F4, DR40. Yeah. Um, Basically, mic level is just for when you have like a microphone. Like th this, this lavalier I have is going to be a mic level input. Um, <clears throat> and most handhelds are going to be mic level input. But when you're interfacing with audio equipment like boards and uh, stuff like that, it's going to be coming in through line level. And then while you're in the subject, you can also talk about balance versus unbalanced audio. And um, definitely lot goes a lot further into audio. But ultimately, the more you can get a balanced audio signal, the lower the noise floor is going to be. And by noise floor, have you ever just listened to your audio and in between when you hear stuff, you just hear the <clears throat> that's kind of That's the noise floor. It just means like, you know, you, you, you don't want a noise floor. When, when there's nothing, you want to hear nothing. So if you're hearing something, it just means it's got a high noise floor. And if you're using balanced equipment with balanced cables, then you have virtually no, no noise at the bottom. And you, that's why then in post, you can just crank up your audio in post and you're not integrated. Because normally when you crank up your audio in post, you're also cranking up the noise floor. So even though the audio gets louder, you hear the tss louder. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to go over all that audio stuff kind of like in, in this class, but and, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not doing the, the best job. OK. Omnidirectional versus cardioid. Cardio, <laughs> cardio pickup <laughs> patterns. <laughs> um, omnidirectional, most lavalier mics are probably going to be omnidirectional, which is great, especially if you don't mic the bride. In this way, like when the group, you know, when, you're when they're standing up next to each other, the bride will actually be picked up on the groom's microphone. If you just had a cardioid, um, it's going to just mostly pick up the person right above it. And for handhelds, omnidirectional is great for when you're kind of passing the mic back and forth. Um, cardioid is better for if like you're, you're a singer on stage with a bunch, bunch of other people. It's, gonna, it's not going to pick up the people to the left and right of you. Just kind of like good stuff to know, especially when you're picking up microphones. I like to say quiet yourself and listen to what your audio equipment is picking up. Um, I think I mentioned this somewhere else later on too. Like especially if you're recording like people reading stuff. Like if, if you bring a groom into this room and because you want to have them read a letter, I always just quiet myself for a second and hear what's happening. This room is pretty sound dead actually. It's actually really good. Um, but sometimes you'll do that and you'll notice that there's like a refrigerator in the background, an AC unit, um, something that's making noise. Just it's, it's important to kind of listen for and because you want to try to eliminate it. <clears throat> monocolor versus bicolor versus RGB lighting. Uh, these are monocolor lights. My LED panel in the back, which I'm not using today, is a bicolor. And so basically the difference between um, th it, these lights are monocolor that you can't dial in the temperature of the lights. And um, mo most lights are probably bicolor where you can you know, adjust them between like two different ranges, you know, whether or not you're going more blue or more yellow. Then you have full RGB where you can just literally hit any single color you want on the spectrum. Though it's really interesting, there's this YouTube video that shows that those RGB lights aren't really um, as good as just using a mono light with putting gels in front of it. Um, probably too much for this class, but I, I, you know, with the gear stuff, I just I never know how far to go before it's just too much. 
For um, reception lighting, I'm a big fan of just like, you know, having uh, bicolor lights would be great. Right now, we, we just have the single temperature on these lights. A lot of those, uh, LED, a lot of those LEDs are bicolor, where you can dial in to get a specific color temperature. I think those are really, it'd be really great tool to have for receptions. That way, you can kind of get the color you want. Well, we, if it's a ballroom reception and it's indoors with tungsten, tungsten's great. But if you have a reception hall that has a lot of windows and it's still daylight and a lot of daylight's coming in, then we put our daylight filter on. And then once it gets nighttime, I think we take them back off because you can, mm -hmm. then it looks normal again. Um, if you're supplying the PA, focus more on if it's sounding great at the recording versus how it sounds live. This sounds, this is one of those things that I say that sounds terrible. Like if you're going, if you're bringing a PA system to a rehearsal dinner, I focus more on the recording and then after the recording, how it sounds live. And sometimes because of the room acoustics, I have to kind of keep the PA system a little lower so I don't get too much feedback. Uh, I'll do that just to make sure the recording is better than, um, and even if it sounds a little janky live, it's, 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 it's okay. Does anyone here offer rehearsal dinner coverage? Do you guys, does anyone here have a PA system, system that they bring, a few of you? I'm gonna go more into um, rehearsal dinners and um, PA systems in my upsells portion where I can really tell you guys how you can increase your bottom line with your wedding video company by offering these types of things because any single one of you could be offering this and just really increasing your profit, profits a lot. I wanted to go over scheduling stuff up with you guys because we've learned a lot of things um, with what we've done and we wanted to kind of um, impart this knowledge to you because we've had a lot of experience, we've gone, gone through a lot of scenarios in which um, we've had a lot of bad logistics and we felt that these tips would really help out with kind of like getting through the wedding day, especially when logistics were really bad. Uh, we often get asked if the schedule is good, but rarely will our feedback change much. Has anyone, <clears throat> you get asked by the planner if it looks good, you know, they send you the schedule, they're like, how does it look? You're like, eh, looks all right. No, but it's just like, what, do you, what, are, they, what are you gonna say? Like, if, if you tell them that it doesn't look good, they're not gonna change anything. I mean, they what? Well, yeah, sometimes, most of the times they just send it. Some people, they say, hey, let me know if you have any questions or concerns, but it's already too late. We have to learn to be okay with the hand that's dealt. Good vide videographers don't necessarily have clout with scheduling changes. They're uh, just good at making the best of it. Just wanted uh, to kind of uh, talk about the, you know, when you get a schedule that's bad, um, you know, we just make the best of it. We just kind of push through and just, um, we can't really make changes to it. You know, when you find out that they're doing introductions, going into dances, going into special dances, going into toasts, going into all these things all after a row, and you know that it's impossible to kind of be fully set up for all those things. You just have to just make the best of it. I mean, sometimes you can ask the planner for like a minute in between, but usually you just have to kind of push through. Sometimes asking for uh, small things like adding in small pockets time can be accommodated. Maybe five minutes in between events is set up. We've had success with planners just asking for like, you know, between toasts and special dances, especially for a lot of a, uh, these like uh, Asian weddings we're doing where they have like special performances mixed in with toasts, gets really complicated. So really just to kind of like, um, when you're dealing with the planner, it's just, um, they'll, they can sometimes accommodate just a little bit for you. Just, it's, uh, it never hurts to ask. If you don't take charge during rehearsal dinners, you will probably end up staying late. Um, if you've done rehearsal dinners, there's, no, there's rarely a planner. And if you're contracted for two hours or three hours, you have to tell them, start toast, do this or that, because if you don't, they're just gonna run late and then you're gonna end up being there late because it's hard to ask for additional hours and you know you need to stay there for the toast and it just gets complicated. Um, get this schedule as early as possible. Don't wait to be given it. Ask for it a month in advance, even if it's a draft and not finalized. Most of what you need is already in stone. I always start asking planners about a month in advance for schedule. And one of the biggest reasons is if you wait for it to be given to you and it stays before the wedding, your window to ask for minor adjustments is likely closed and getting the schedule early is essential for adding an additional coverage. Don't be the last person to ask the couple to write a last minute check. If you're getting your schedule way in advance, 
um, you have the opportunity to make upsells with the client. You have an opportunity to say, hey, look, we need an, we need an additional hour or two hours added on to this. Um, what do you guys feel about that? Your chances of getting it a month before the wedding are like 100 times greater than if you wait like three days before the wedding. And you know, it's an ability to make a little bit extra money and it just will really help you get the coverage you need. You know, have you ever asked, um, have you ever tried to be like the last person to ask for money from like the bride and groom? And they, 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 they lament and how the florist just got back to them and wants an additional like $3,000 and you know, like the fondue table ran overboard. You know, I had one couple tell me that the tent ended up being more too much money, and so they had to cut back in video coverage or something. It's like, tent is like embarrassing. <laughs> Arrive early to drop off gear at the reception if you can. You can also use this time to scout out potential places for a first look in portraits. More often than not, the photographer has not done this, and having some good places in mind can really help you create a better film. <clears throat> I love trying to arrive early, and that just means that if you're arriving like at the, um, maybe at the hotel that the reception is, is at, and maybe they're getting ready there, arriving even just 10, 15 minutes early, if you can drop off gear into the reception, uh, like the stuff you don't need until the reception can really help you with scheduling logistics, especially if you have those days where you're just running around all over the city, and then you have like a 30 minute window to go from the ceremony and be set up for the reception before the introductions. Um, and you know, scouting out for a first look is also great because a lot, uh, maybe not a lot of times, but oftentimes uh, a photographer either has not scouted out for the first look or they were not happy with the places that they chose. And so it can really increase the quality of your films if you, um, if you scout out yourself and have some ideas ready so that way you know you can interject and say, hey, how about this area over here? It might look really good. And it'll really help you increase the quality of your films if you, or just one thing you can do to really help with that. Uh, planner, always make sure you say hi before the wedding, confirm receiving any documentation and ask if they need anything. I always like starting up a conversation with the planner. We kind of talked about just, you know, good communication. I always reach out to the photographer ahead of the wedding. Opening up communication early helps working with them. We kind of touched about this before. DJ band, you know, letting, um, oftentimes I just, I meet with them kind of like the day of the wedding while they're setting up just to, just to say hi. I'm just always about fostering great communication. You know, we kind of went over this before about making sure we include them in on what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> I always ask a venue if they need anything. Sorry, it keeps coming back to kind of the communication. We've kind of talked about the venue part before. Um, that was pretty much it for the scheduling. I, more or less, I wanted to kind of include that stuff in just to kind of give you some ideas on how to better work with the day, better work with the logistics that you have. Are there any specific questions regarding like logistics, scheduling stuff, or gear stuff that I can help answer for you guys? Or is there anything that you... Uh, I guess I'm a little curious about your approach to the reversal dinner. Um, I'm assuming that if you're on Saturday wedding, it's happening on Friday, Well, we try to. Do they have to book the rehearsal dinner and book the wedding so that you know you have to block off that Friday? Or has that been? I guess for us, we try not to double book, like back to back. Anymore. We try not we to, used we, to. We used to. And we hated life whenever we were doing <laughs> like two or three weddings in a weekend. How many of you, how many of you are doing multiple weddings a weekend? <laughs> uh, it's a young man's game. <laughs> <laughs> We don't, we try, and, uh, it's it more rare, rare these days that we would do two weddings in a weekend, but, what was that? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, it is, a, it is a, a good question to ask about, you know, re blocking off that date, and uh, even when we were doing two weddings a weekend, I would still do it, and more often than not, the, the second wedding would be on a Sunday, more or less on a Saturday, on a uh, Friday, anyway, that I found. So I would just go ahead and book it, and um, oftentimes before, um, before I would book any other event that would happen on the rehearsal dinner day, um, I would contact the, the client and, and see if they wanted to add in coverage. 
I mean, it's just a question about how you want to run your business and how you want to, um, you know, if you want to leave that open for, and then maybe what you can just do is you can always just leave that rehearsal dinner open maybe until like a month before the wedding. And if you haven't booked by then, then you can reach out to the first couple and say, hey, you know, then you make the push for rehearsal dinner coverage. Can I ask how much you charge for rehearsal dinner? We don't do oh, you haven't done it? I, I think it's maybe our area not really coming. Like, we oh, don't really okay. need to ask. I think I've gotten this maybe like twice in all like a year. Okay. So it's going to say if, if you feel like you would rather hold out for a wedding, then maybe you're not charging enough for the rehearsal dinner. So especially with, he'll talk about the upsells later, but you can do the rehearsal dinner and add a PA system, add a love story, and a photo montage, and then it's like almost the cost of a wedding. So I would rather do all that. And a fraction of the work, less yeah. editing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we go over the packages yeah. and the upsells portion, we'll, we'll share with our, uh, you guys our pricing and you kind of get to see what we charge and, you know, kind of like how we work with our upsells. Yeah, the whole rehearsal dinner thing is, there's a huge portion of that coming up in one of the next subjects about kind of like um, pricing yourself. And uh, there's, there's a lot more I have to say about it. And, you know, I'll kind of make the push on why I think it's important to push it and like uh, what the potential is and, you know, how much money you can make and um, just what it adds to the film as well. But real quick, like the whole point, part, part of the point of sharing you guys the scheduling is our wedding days are still crazy. We have bad logistics, we're running around, we're hustling, and, but you would never know that in the wedding film. So it's like if you're looking at our wedding films, like, oh man, they must have easy days to be able to get those shots. It's not true. Okay, we've just learned how to strategize and work together and, and kind of beat those logistics. Yeah, so. bad logistics are terrible. I mean, it's just like, you, I mean, we've all gotten the schedules and we're just like, how? You know, especially if there's like, <laughs> especially if there's like four different places you're going to, or you're doing like an Indian wedding and they're doing like the brat going right into the ceremony, mm -hmm. going right into. It's just it's, a lot of pre-planning. It's a lot of pre-planning. Yeah. And the more pre-planning you can do, the more successful you'll be at the wedding day. Just. I mean, if, if it's not out of the way and if we can drop it off, I mean, there's a lot of times where we do set up our lights and, you know, I'll drop off the lights and I'll, I'll set these up and kind of have them ready to go. Sometimes you can't, though, and it's just, you know, you have to make, um, <clears throat> you just have to make a sacrifice somewhere. You know, it's just like, what, what are the events that are coming up? Like, you know, for us, audio and light are, are paramount importance. You know, we can just get cameras up and running real quick. We just need to make sure that they're lit well and they have, we have good audio if they're doing toasts. We, I mean, we've had to do it so many times, though, or I, I don't understand it. It's like, they, you know, getting out of the ceremony takes like 10, 15 minutes. You know, it's like a 40 or maybe it's like a 20 minute drive. And then just getting into the reception, like in Atlanta, like I, one of the places, the Capital City Club Midtown. Oh, yeah. is one of the well, worst locations. The elevator was broken that day. So we had to go up all these stairs. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but you know so if we can we do if not I mean we're just trying to haul and just hoping that the reception starts late anyway I think yeah I think for the most part Sarah we do drop it off if we see a nightmare situation we're like okay let's go ahead and drop stuff off I think well, that's the best scenario like, out of town guests they'll just bring one two, two three miles of buses and so you're not they're not having to get in the car right you're so right it's just like yeah. they dropped off at this tour yeah mm -hmm. I think we used to, but then over time, I realized I don't need portraits if I don't have them. Um, I like them in the films, but if they didn't schedule time for it, for it then I'm not going to push for that. Um, and also, that might not even be a priority. You know, if they're not getting portraits with the photographer, they might not want a lot of romantic stuff like that in their video, too. Um, so that just might. I guess I'll lean into that a little too much at this point for the cinematic element mm -hmm. and stuff instead of just sitting in 
you know, hotel room or whatever. I like need that almost to make it pop the next day. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I'm, that's probably my own thing, just to rest. Yeah. I mean, we like portraits, but all the real moments too are really special too. So I mean. And John, if you got the live sales call with me, Paul and his family just emailed me a schedule for the 28th, having me arrive at 1 o'clock, rooms, portraits at 1, 10, ceremony at 2, everything before 1 o'clock, it's all the bride of breath, first look with the groom, first look with dad, all the brides are already wearing dress, uh, all the bride's photos were done. Hi, this is John on behalf of Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Before open dancing? They'll have all the first dances done and toast, and then talk around and leave, and open dancing starts. But you show up after the bride's ready and after pictures. And before the dancing. But is there a first look? Yeah, I missed that too. Oh, you missed the first look. They were for eight hours. I don't know how they, how they make this happen. But do, you, did you, do you promise a film length? Uh, this is like a big tag of three to four minute like, highlight film. Yeah. And it's still like there's no content other than the next yeah. ceremony. And and what we would just do in that situation is we would contact the, the client and just say, look, you know, in order to make the best film we can, we recommend that we come in at this time, even if it means, I mean, really what you're sounding like, it's just they need to add in additional hours. I mean, there's, there's really nothing you could do besides add in additional hours and just let them know if, if, you, if you can't do that, then, you know, the, the film is going to reflect that. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. uh, how do you say she had receiver and you guys, you know, you guys are doing your own like wireless microphone, is that what I heard you say? Yeah, so the system I use is the Sennheiser D1835. It's, um, it's a Sennheiser 835 um, uh, digital system. What I love about the digital system is that it automatically uh, backs up to, if it detects interference, it's automatically going to fall back to a frequency that doesn't have an interference. So it's kind of like a set it and forget it system. Not recommended for big installs or when you're running multiple lines at the same time. But I mean, I've been using this microphone since 2016. And I've only had like twice when there's ever been any amount of interference, then it's immediately gone away. So it's nice because you don't have to worry about monitoring frequencies to make sure that it's going to sound good. But I literally bring in the receiver. I, I have my mic on a mic stand. Bring in the receiver and hand it, you know, hand it off to the DJ. Uh, or band, but not, not quite handed off, but, you know, work with them and getting it implemented into their system. And then, you know, I've got my mic on the dance floor. They're getting a feed from me, and they can do whatever they want to that signal. And then the, the audio that I'm getting directly off the receiver from the microphone is uh, crystal clear. Um, the, the only problem you run into is when you have, like, bands or DJs who just have big systems that are just pointed right into the middle of the dance floor, which is where you want the toast to happen. And it just becomes complicated because um, then the, the audio is just going right back into the microphone. That's the whole story in itself. But I, I, I bring my mic with me to every wedding, and I, I put it in probably about 90% of the time. It's a Sennheiser D1835. It's gone on sale as low as like $350, $400. I think I bought it for $600 originally. And it, the beautiful thing about it is that we have a consistency with all of our films. And if you listen, if you listen to most of our films, it'll actually have this mic. And it, it's got a nice warm sound to it. I just like a light, I like a warm mic. Um, the, the, I like it more than the Shures, but you know, they all have digital systems, whether or not you want to go Sennheiser or Shure, but. Um, since you're using a splitter and you're both able to use the same transmitter, if they have the same one, is there still a benefit to bringing your own? You're saying that they have the same microphone? Yeah, yeah and if, because it, it, if, if, yeah, if, they, if like the DJ or band has the same equipment, I've learned that you still bring it in. And it, what it all comes back down to is that, you know, they're going to be, uh, uh, sometimes it's easier handing them the receiver than trying to split. Because, you know, a lot of times they don't know which microphone is which. And I, I've tried the splitter so many times and then what happens is the band hands off the wrong microphone. And then, you know, I'm not getting the audio that I wanted. And I'm worse off than if I had just taken a feed off of their speaker. So bringing in your own microphone kind of gives you control over the situation, makes it so that you make sure your microphone is the one being used. You can put it off to the side. 
I bring it onto the dance floor when it's, when it's time to do the toast. And it is not, I've had it happen so many times where they give them the wrong mic, and I try to make it work. I, well, I still use a splitter because I split off the receiver and take one feed and give them another. It is? Yeah, but the G4 is available as the same concept. I'd have to look into that. I did not know it was discontinued. I'll look into it later on tonight and see if there's a um, good replacement. But the G4? It doesn't sound like the same line now. It's set up. Yeah, but the Ds are the digitals. Right, right. But this, I'm talking about as far as like that and like that. Oh, you're saying are they, it is good? You mean like these, like these body packs? No, no, no. Hand held mic, wireless hand held mic. First speeches in my stand. I'm not familiar with it. the only one I'm really familiar with with Sennheiser was their digital system. I wanted to go with that just because I wanted to. I mean, it's got the A35 capsule. So if you're talking just sounds, if it's got the A35 or so. Now have to look into that. Not now. Uh, there were any, any other questions about the audio or the, or the gear? Or? Just more of a clarification. I, I think you already answered it, but I just want to make sure. So you use the uh, Sennheiser system and it has the, uh, the receiver. Then the receiver goes into the splitter, and then the DJ gets a line out of the splitter, not the receiver itself. Right, off the splitter. Okay. Um, and I brought the splitter with me, and I can show it later. Should have drawn a diagram. Should have drawn a diagram. <laughs> just, just making sure, because earlier I thought I had heard you say you give the receiver to the DJ or whatever, and so that's what I was thinking. Like you're just giving him the receiver and then getting get the signal. Right. So basically, I have a one foot XLR coming out of the receiver into the splitter, and then it's all, the splitter is already installed. So then um, you take one, they take one, and then you both get a clean feed. I have the splitter with me. I don't have the. I mean, maybe I can bring it in tomorrow. Yeah, because I can yeah. figure it out, but I may need an hour or two. But I don't have that in the mm -hmm. But it's really instrumental with like really getting good, consistent audio with your films. I mean, I'm warning you though. It's 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 a little bit of a dance with uh, getting them to um, actually take it. Do you use the, the whirlpool splitter. Uh, the whirlwind. <laughs> yeah, I use the uh, whirlwind splitter. <laughs> their, their products are solid. I don't know of anyone else making splitters, but they're a good price. They're solid. Been using the same ones for years. They work. They work great. Okay. Do you use this during the ceremony as well? If the officiating Sometimes, um, on occasion. You we've, know, we've saved some ceremonies before by bringing our mic. We've yeah. saved multiple ceremonies by having a microphone because DJ forgot that they were supposed to bring a wireless, and you know, for one re reason or, or another. Um, it doesn't actually really do anything for us. It's not like they're writing us thank you notes for saving the ceremony audio. Nobody knows. But, um, you know, ultimately, we're still trying to put a mic on the efficient anyway. So I'm not overly concerned about using that, uh, about getting that mic in, because I still want my, it's probably too much trouble to, to do it for the ceremony, too. But I do have it with me, and sometimes it gets integrated. Well, the thing is, I mean, yeah, it, it's a, it's a fight <laughs> about getting people to actually go up. And I try to, I try to tell them and say that, you know, it's about the lighting, it's about the audio quality, it's about our cameras. We can't move our cameras. You know, we had this one rehearsal dinner at the beginning of 2016, or 2017, where it was like the dad. And he was just like, I don't need to go. You know, it's like I forget what did he say. I don't know which wedding you're talking about. Um. But it was just like the dad made a comment about, oh, how he, does, he doesn't use these types of things. And it was sad because he gave such a heartfelt toast. And, you know, we recorded it off the shotgun off our camera. And if, as a doc edit, it was there. But it wasn't something we can use for the cinematic, even though it would have been beautiful for it. But, I mean, how, how, many, how many times do you get the, uh, the, 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 the drunk, hold on, the drunk groomsman? I got this. <laughs> he starts walking along. And... Um. 
I'm I tell I tell them if you move, you are gonna ruin the video. Cause I yeah. understand because I got tired. I I literally tell them if you move out of this, I can I like put roses. I feel like drunk y'all. But I literally <laughs> tell them if you move out of this space, you are gonna ruin that video. I try. I mean, it's, it's sometimes it works. Sometimes Depends upon the intoxication level sometimes, but... So, Sarah, to answer your question, like, we tell them it's really important for lighting and for our setup that they stay in one spot. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm specifically just speaking about rehearsal dinners. Yeah. A lot of them, they, they're intentionally wanting to be casual. Like, they, yeah. you know, and they push back a lot of things. We don't want people to be in the same. We don't want people to feel like they have to go up. We just want them to stand up. Yeah. We, we've definitely had that, and when, when that happens... Usually, I think I'm on the camera getting the toaster, and John will actually be just holding a torchlight and just lighting each person. Yeah, it's so rare, it's rare that we really push to have it happen elsewhere, yeah, and, think, and yeah. we just have to tell them if you if you like our films and if you want this type of quality in your film, this is the way it has to be. If there's concerns about people going up to actually do the toast, you just have to create mob mentality. You tell them, look, you just take two or three people and ask them to go up and give a toast. And once you've opened it up, people are more willing to go up. Mm -hmm. It's for sure a fight. I mean, a lot of what we do is a fight. I mean, we're always fighting one battle or another, trying to get good audio, good lighting, good anything. I mean, so much of what we do is just fighting things to, to get. I'm not talking about like, you know, fighting the, the photographer. I'm just like saying, put, fighting and pushing through bad logistics or people who are just trying to I think extend fight, your- Fighting for excellence. Fighting for excellence. Yeah. That's something we do at every wedding. And you know, the, the, one of the reasons why we got to where we got to is because we're always fighting for it. We don't, we typically don't give up. And we're making, because at the end of the day, the, the bride cares that her film is great. She doesn't care about how we got, to, I mean, that sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? She wants you, or you know, the client wants you to fight for this. They may not yeah. have asked specifically for it, but if they've hired you to do what you do, they're asking you to fight for all these things to get all, you know, to get all the elements there to make sure you have a great film. But I'm just letting you know, like, we fight a lot. No. But if somebody says a hard no, no discussion, we leave it alone. We're not gonna, we're not gonna push that hard like that. So. I push hard. Do you guys to the reception as well? Yeah, he's in charge of the mic. He'll put it out. He'll even heighten it for different people every time there's a different height. John's going up there and adjusting it. We've gone back and forth a couple times about the stand, but ultimately, a stand can look really classy if people use it effectively. Sometimes people just take the mic off and hold it, and the stand is right there. And I'll actually come in and kind of remove the stand a little bit just for that toaster. Um, but I, I like the stand. I like to think that it kind of keeps people in stationary. Place and not turning their backs to your camera. But I think it looks really classy. I, you know, people speaking to a stand as opposed to holding it, it just, it's got a really nice feel to well, it. Well, and when people hold it, they hold it down here. So that doesn't look good anyway, and you're getting bad audio. Yeah. <laughs> I try to mic train people really quickly before they give a toast. I'm like, you want to be about this far away from the mic. They're like, oh, okay, got it. And they hold the mic down here. <laughs> it's every time. It's, they freak out when they hear themselves, I think. So is that what it is? Yeah. One of my biggest fights right now is like you look at films like Pan, what they do, and how much candy is in there from like the bridal suite and stuff like that. But I fight, and I know everybody does, uh, the music's playing, and, and you want them to keep their vibe going, but you yeah. really want to grab some great moments. And when you t if you ever do turn it off, everybody gets quiet mm -hmm. and it gets awkward. So, is there anything y'all have ever seen that can combat that? So it's like, about the about the, uh, the the music right. during the preparations. Yeah. I mean, I used to turn it down all the time, but I I think we use prep stuff less and less these days. So we're not. Well, I was gonna say we only need certain parts of preparations. So if they're like in their robes and having champagne and they're kind of like if you like getting like the mingling, they're all interacting. Um, a lot of times we don't need that audio. But then when they, she gets into her dress, we're like, okay, let's turn off the music. If there's a letter, we'll turn off the music. If they're on their bed, we'll turn off the music because we want that interaction. So there's, we know the parts we want the audio. So that's not the first thing we do. We don't turn off the music when we walk into bride prep. It's literally probably after an hour that we've been there. Then we'll say, okay, let's turn off the music. Or if you're in Georgia, you're turning off the uh, football game. <clears throat> it's all groom prep.
<laughs> but we'll get into that actually in our next section, how to do, um, how to film for narrative as well as cinematic, and then there's like, yeah, we cover that.